Hey, hey friends, Ashton here with SMNP Reviews. Welcome to our YouTube video on the basics of breastfeeding. This is a knowledge gap for many students because it's not something we focus on heavily in school. However, you can definitely see questions about breastfeeding on your certification exam. In this video, we're going to review current recommendations and benefits of breastfeeding. We'll also provide you with a brief overview of basic mechanics, common concerns, safety issues, and complications to be on the lookout for. So let's get started. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, or ACOG, supports an individual's informed decision making about breastfeeding. We know that patients definitely have the right to make their own informed choice about whether or not to breastfeed. For patients who desire to breastfeed, ACOG and the American Academy of Pediatrics both recommend exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of life with continued breastfeeding while complementary foods are introduced during the infant's first year of life or longer. So what are some of the benefits of breastfeeding? Immediately after birth, breastfeeding helps the uterus contract and can result in less postpartum blood loss. Breastfeeding is also associated with a decreased risk of postpartum depression and a lower risk of developing conditions such as breast cancer, hypertension, and type 2 diabetes. Breastfed infants have a decreased risk of sudden infant death syndrome or SIDS and a lower rate of common childhood illnesses such as upper respiratory infections, otitis media, and gastrointestinal illnesses. Now that we've covered some of the benefits of breastfeeding, let's move on and discuss the hour immediately following delivery. This time is often referred to as the golden hour, as studies have shown that newborns instinctively breastfeed during the first hour of life. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that all persons who want to breastfeed have skin-to-skin -skin contact with their baby immediately after birth. This in turn can promote breastfeeding and the infant latching onto the breast. A good latch is a crucial first step to successful breastfeeding. Without a proper latch, the infant may not get all the milk they need and it could be a very painful experience for the breastfeeding person. How do we know if we have a good latch? Well, there are a couple of different signs we can look for. First, the infant's lips should be slightly everted and the latch should be comfortable and painless for the breastfeeding person. We can also look for signs of swallowing and we shouldn't hear any clicking noises which could indicate that the infant has broken the seal on the breast. Now let's review a couple of frequently asked questions during those first few weeks of breastfeeding. When does milk come in? Well, during the first few days after birth, the body produces colostrum, a thick yellowish pre-milk. It is often referred to as liquid gold because it is packed full of nutrients and antibodies that can boost the newborn's immune system and help fight infection. Milk will then begin to gradually replace colostrum beginning two to five days after delivery. Another common question is, how often should breastfeeding occur? During the newborn's first week of life, they may want to eat very often, even every hour. As a general guide, newborns should breastfeed at least eight to 12 times per day during the first few weeks of life. As they grow and their stomachs can hold more milk, they may go longer spans of time between feedings. Lastly, how do we know if the baby is getting enough milk? So there are a couple of different indicators we can look at here. After the third or fourth day of life, infants should be having at least six or more wet diapers per day. Less wet diapers or concentrated urine could be a sign of dehydration. Additionally, newborns typically have a yellow seedy bowel movement after each feeding for about the first month. After that time period, bowel movements typically lessen in frequency. We can also observe the infant's behavior after breastfeeding. Do they seem satisfied and content after eating? Do they sleep well? And are they alert when they're awake? We can also monitor the infant's weight. Remember, it's normal for infants to lose some of their birth weight during the first two weeks of life. However, we expect infants to be back at their birth weight at the two-week mark and begin having steady weight gain. It's important to note here that healthy breastfed infants typically gain weight more slowly than formula-fed infants during the first year. On average, infants typically double their birth weight at six months and triple it at one year. Breast milk is designed to provide the perfect amount of calories and optimal nutrition to support infant growth and development. However, Breast milk alone does not provide infants with an adequate amount of vitamin D. 
it is recommended that breastfed infants receive 400 international units per day of vitamin D supplementation beginning in the first few days of life. Most newborns have sufficient iron stores for approximately the first six months of life. At this age, an infant's iron needs can be met through iron supplement drops or the introduction of iron-rich foods and iron-fortified cereals. Solid foods are typically introduced between four and six months of age when the infant has developed the motor skills needed to eat and shows an interest in food. However, breast milk will continue to provide the majority of nutrients. During this time, solid foods are still just for practice as the infant starts to sample a variety of new foods, tastes, and textures. Remember, under one, food for fun. Now let's switch gears and discuss medication considerations. When prescribing medications to a breastfeeding person, there are two important things to remember. Is the medication safe while breastfeeding? And does the medication impact milk supply? The good news is that although many medications do in fact pass into breast milk, most have little to no effect on milk supply or the well-being of the infant. I do want to include a special note here about contraception. Although lactating persons are less fertile, there is still a chance of pregnancy occurring. Progestin-only contraceptives, or the mini pill, are often prescribed for breastfeeding persons because it does not appear to affect milk supply in the way that combined oral contraceptives can. However, the American Academy of Pediatrics has now approved the use of low-dose combined oral contraceptives in breastfeeding persons once milk production is well established. The last topic I briefly want to touch on before we finish this video is some of the most common breastfeeding problems and complications. In the first three to five days after birth, nipple soreness is common, but anything beyond a slight tenderness when the infant latches on could be a sign that something is wrong with the infant's latch or position. The breastfeeding person can try changing positions such as the football hold or sideline position, and we've listed some resources at the end of this video that provide excellent graphics of the different breastfeeding positions. If latching problems persist, it could be due to other issues such as a flat or inverted nipple or tongue tie in the infant, and a referral to a lactation consultant is definitely recommended. Engorgement occurs when the breasts get too full of milk, which leads to pain and tenderness. Engorgement can also impair the infant's ability to latch onto the breast. Breastfeeding persons experiencing engorgement can manually express a small amount of milk or use a breast pump prior to each feeding to soften the areola and make it easier for the baby to latch on. Oversupply occurs when the breastfeeding person makes too much milk. Generally, milk production is determined by the infant's demand. However, in this case, the supply exceeds the demand, which we think of as a good thing, right? Well, for people with oversupply of breast milk, the rush of milk can be so strong that it actually causes the infant to choke or cough or have difficulty feeding. Thankfully, this problem usually will go away on its own. Mastitis is a localized inflammation of the breast that is associated with fever, myalgias, breast pain, and erythema. Although it can occur anytime during lactation, mastitis is most common during the first six weeks postpartum. It often occurs as a result of prolonged engorgement, a blocked milk duct, oversupply, infrequent feeding, or rapid weaning. Treatment may include pain relief, such as the use of cold compresses, warm baths or showers, and acetaminophen or ibuprofen for analgesia and fever. The patient should be encouraged to continue breastfeeding beginning on the affected breast first. In the setting of non-severe infection, outpatient therapy can be initiated with dicloxacillin or cephalexin. If the patient has an allergy to beta-lactanes, erythromycin or clindamycin may be used alternatively. Also, it's important to remember, friends, that if our patient is not improving with antibiotics, mastitis can progress to a breast abscess, and that is definitely something we don't want to miss. Candidiasis is another common complication of breastfeeding. Candida infection can occur due to cracked or damaged nipples, or conversely, oral thrush can be passed from the breastfed infant to the breastfeeding person. Breastfeeding can continue while candidiasis is being treated. The breastfeeding person is typically treated with topical antifungals, while the infant is treated with an oral antifungal such as nystatin. Candidiasis can be prevented by keeping the breast clean and dry, 
good hand washing and cleaning baby items such as pacifiers and breast pump parts. On this last slide, we wanted to share some resources with you to provide a wealth of information on breastfeeding, and we've linked these in the video notes. LactMed is a database that contains information on medications and one that I have found to be very helpful in my personal practice. And that's it for breastfeeding, friends. Be sure to check out our website for more information on our live reviews, self-paced courses, and question banks that contain over a thousand practice questions. We are rooting for you. Happy studying.